Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the USC Viterbi Family Weekend Dean's Reception. It is my honor and great pleasure to introduce our host for tonight's event, Senior Associate Dean for Viterbi Admission and Student Engagement, Ms. Kelly Goulis. Welcome Viterbi families and guests. We are so excited to have you join us at the 2020 Trojan Family Weekend the Turby Dean's reception. We hope you have enjoyed your time and have taken advantage of all of the Turby events and programs scheduled over the last couple of days. Our event today will split into three different sections. First, we will have a welcome from the Dean. Next, there will be a conversation with Dean Yortzis and four current Viterbi students. And after that, we will open the Q&A section for you, our parents and guests to ask questions. The way the Q&A portion of the program will work is that you have an opportunity to enter your questions in the Q&A area of the Zoom app. So please feel free to add your questions to the Q&A section as we will not be monitoring the chat for questions. You can, you can use the chat and I see you already have if you'd like to meet each other or communicate with other parents and guests throughout this program. To start, I would like to take a moment to recognize and acknowledge the Dean's senior leadership team, department chairs, faculty and staff who are here today. And now, it's my honor to introduce the Dean of the Viterbi School of Engineering, Yanis Yortzis. Thank you very much, Kelly. And a good evening or morning to all of you, wherever you are. And thank you for being here this evening for the Trojan Family Weekend. When we gather in person, in town and gown, or at the Epstein Plaza last year, no one could have anticipated how the world would turn a mere few months later. Then we discussed our pride for our many accomplishments, anticipated a bright future for the year ahead. And that future unfolded brilliantly as we did expect it, until that is March 15, 2020, when as I have said in jest before, the wave function collapsed this is the vocabulary of the many world theories of quantum mechanics. I know it's esoteric, but actually it is so appropriate. Namely, essentially and collectively, we moved overnight to another world, the COVID world, one we still inhabit. It's a world from which we hope to disembark soon so that we can rejoin the pre-COVID one, hopefully soon. This semester, starting a few weeks ago, I volunteered to teach a short course on sustainable energy to a group of our undergraduate students. It is a class that has kept me busy. I have given it before, but I thought I should teach it this year to learn firsthand the challenges and opportunities of our new world, that of strictly online teaching. It is free of charge, no overload, no teaching credit, no tuition charge. Now, there are some unusual parallels between sustainable energy and today's incredible trajectory we are globally and unwittingly following with COVID-19. And let me explain the parallels. The fundamental pretext of sustainability is that ours is really the era of exponential changes. In technology, in population, or equivalently in the flattening of the world, in environmental changes. And so is our COVID-19 era. It's an era of exponential changes. Since this is a Zoom meeting, I can use slides to show that. The trends in this slide are interconnected. Technology has brought unprecedented positive changes that have benefited the human condition. But because of this inherently society-centric aspect of all technology, and because also of its exponential nature, technology has brought important unintended consequences. The good news is that technology, science and engineering can be counted to come up again with solutions, a task we have undertaken before time after time. And that's why I'm so optimistic about the future of science and engineering and of our engineering students. In this optimism, I will paraphrase Winston Churchill to say, you can always count of people to do the right thing, the right thing, and I, in parenthesis, I would add, namely to turn to science and engineering, close parenthesis, after they have tried everything else. But this will require trust, 
a theme that I will return and again and again in this talk. The other news that closely go with, with them, however, is that it also behooves us as engineers to understand the human centricity in pretty much everything that we do. And most importantly now, with the extraordinary power of technology. Now, the very same Winston Churchill has said, the first duty of the university is to teach wisdom, not trade, character, not technicalities. We want a lot of engineers in the modern world, but we do not want a world of engineers, close uh, quotations. I will address these themes, but also I will try to prove Sir Winston slightly wrong because we are now creating a very different brand of engineer where character comes together with competence. A breed of engineer very different than the stereotype of his era. Now, what do exponential changes in the role of technology or human nature have to do with COVID, you might ask? I think that the reason our world has changed so much so fast when COVID descended was our inability to collectively comprehend and accordingly adjust to the exponential nature of the pandemic. Indeed, the growth of infections is also exponential. Moreover, such an exponential unfolded in front of us in a time span of weeks, not years or decades or centuries, as is the case with the other exponentials I mentioned. Used to think through our limited linear lens where we extrapolate on a straight line, we collectively miss the specter of this impending pandemic. So how can we address rapid changes of this type? There are two fundamental and simple requirements. Outstanding competence that we do in all engineering schools, but also outstanding character, because these together, they spell trust. I equate this trust to the required ingredient to respond in an agile way along any exponential changes. Indeed, it is more than um, a response. It is the creation of mindsets to react collectively fast to all changes, to being agile and being innovative. COVID demands many and different versions of trust. With this onset of COVID, I thought that it will primarily be tested. What will primarily be tested would be our values, our competence and our character our collective trust to navigate together these unprecedented times. And I can say that the Viterbi School came through quite well. Perhaps because we already had considerable experience with online teaching, perhaps because of the cohesiveness of the school, perhaps because of our ability to constantly reinvent. The transition to the COVID world was mostly smooth. It was effective and more or less seamless. Looking back, I cannot see a single thing we would have done differently. And I hope that we will be able to say the same a few months later, when we will hopefully move back to the new and perhaps familiar post-COVID world. Arguably, no engineering school in the country was better positioned to make the shift than our school. Nearly 40 years ago, in 1972, we offered 50 years ago, we offered our first online courses via the so-called Norman Topping Instructional Television Network or ITV. This was back in 1972. Today, that system known as USC Viterbi's Distance Ed Ed Education Network or DEN consistently ranks in the top online programs in the country. Now, both DEN and the more general online teaching environment will be tested head on in ways we have never been tested before and in the years to come. Another equally impressive effort when the COVID pandemic started was the instant reorientation of the research of many of our faculty to address it. The breadth and depth of the work done was as impressive as it was meaningful. This fall, we decided to effectively collate such work in the form of a series of lectures in a short course we call it Viterbi versus Pandemics. This is offered every Thursday. It's a lecture series that will span the semester. Again, it is 
free of charge to anyone who wants to uh, follow it. The, the work uh, displayed there paints, paints a tableau of the research capacity and competence of our school across many phenomena that range from physical to chemical to biological to social. I would also be remiss if I did not mention the leadership many Viterbi faculty and students exhibited in moving forward in shaping a national initiative, the National Academy of Engineering Call to Action. Launched in April 2020 as a result of a Grand Challenge Scholars Program initiative. As you know, as you may know, the Grand Challenge Program was co-conceived at USC in 2009. And that initiative rapidly became cross-generational. This entirely volunteer effort was led by many at Viterbi, including many uh, Grand Challenge students, faculty, and staff. We hosted two virtual national innovation pitch events, a national K-12 entrepreneurship showcase, and the first of its kind, Gen Z Engineer National Conversation. A truly intergenerational effort at the national scale, which would not have, hap would not have happened without Viterbi, and for which we are very proud. In these extraordinary times, in a pandemic that has disrupted nearly every facet of our lives, character and competence have never been tested, have been tested as never before. And we will continue to be constantly challenged to keep our focus on things that matter, to things we value as individuals and as society. Now, what does the future hold? In a number of areas, we are certain to continue the progress the school was making pre-COVID. But the pace will accelerate as a number of unknown unknowns lurk in the horizon. Remember, we live in an era of exponentials. As we are well through the fall semester, many of the positive, tre positive trends of last year's continue. Our entering undergraduate class is again very well balanced at 48% women, 21% first generation students, 30% historically underrepresented groups. The USC Aero Design Team took first place for the third time at the annual AIAA Design Build Fly Competition by besting 113 teams from around the world to win, to win the remote fly-off in the 2019-2020 competition. USC Viterbi students won first place in again, AIAA small satellite student competition. In a just released study, USC ranked fifth and second among private universities in the top 10 list of universities from which companies like Apple and Google hire. The newly completed bomb family makerspace is ready to receive our students when the university will reopen and the Los Angeles County will allow us. And the new Ginsburg Human Center Computational Computer Science Building, the first lead platinum building on campus, is on the way with an expect expected groundbreaking in early spring. Will the post COVID world revert to the pre COVID world? Probably not in its entirety. The incredible experiment the world is undertaking, where human interaction is essentially online, however, opens up new areas for innovation. Our undergraduate and graduate student affairs teams continue innovating in this arena. They have hosted many online events for new and returning students. New student welcomes, a 48 hours Astenathon, Viterbi live events, a VIP series, and many, many other um, events including career and internship boot camps. And our advancement team has reached to more than 12,000 unique Zoom connections. I'm very optimistic about our future, the pandemic, sour economy, fires and earthquakes notwithstanding. The world will impatiently need talented engineers like the Viterbi engineers with their skills, their knowledge and their mindsets their character, and as soon as possible to help us engineer a fast recovery and a new and bright future. 
In this continuing evolution in a human-centric world of changes, we will need engineers that are trustworthy, engineers with competence and with character. Such are those in the Grand Challenges Scholars Program, which started here at UAC in 2009. Because of this, the engineer of 2020 will be a very different version than the one derided by Sir Winston. They are engineers with tremendous knowledge and skills, but also with deep societal and cultural understandings. These will be members that change the conversation about our discipline, who we are, what we do, and what we look like. One that flips the stereotypes and rephrases the statement of Winston Churchill to, the duty of the university is to teach wisdom and to develop competence and character, so as to help engineer a better world for all humanity. More than a century ago, in 1905, USC offered its first engineering courses. 115 years later, in the process having overcome yet another pandemic in 1918, USC engineering continues to flourish. So despite the haze of today's pandemic and the fog, fog of uncertainty, the mission of the school remains as strong as ever to help engineer a better world for all humanity. It is this vision that continues to drive and inspire us, that prepares us to be in a leading position as we are to rejoin the post-COVID world when the wave function will invariably collapse again as it surely will. Thank you very much and fight on. Thank you, Dean Yorthos. I would now like to introduce our Viterbi students who will be joining the Dean tonight to talk about their experiences at Viterbi. Radhika Agrawal is a computer engineering and computer science major who is the chair of the Women in Engineering Board and co-president of MAKERS. Jacob Totoro is an environmental engineering major who is the president of the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists and students innovating for global challenges. Derek Jones is an industrial and systems engineering major and a Viterbi student ambassador. And Sienna Applebaum is a mechanical engineering major and a freshman academy coach. So Derek, would you like to start us off with a question for the Dean? I'd love to, thank you, Dean Gullis. Um, Dean Yorsos, um, I wanted to ask, uh, what have you and your team done to adjust to this online environment? Well, thank you, Derek. Um, of course, as I mentioned before, uh, we had the, the advantage, if you like, that the semester, the, the latter part of the spring semester went online. And obviously we adjusted very well uh, because of the fact that almost, almost all of our faculty I uh, have the ability to teach on this distance education network, which is the, the, the ability to uh, teach online and has been around for, for a very long time, as I mentioned. Um, I personally, as I mentioned, I taught a short class, which I found to be extraordinary. And I relay, relate a lot with the comments that were made about Zoom fatigue. I can see our kids, how tired they are. My class is at six o'clock in the evening. And uh, even though they were, um, you know, very excited about the subject. I could see how, um, you know, uh, stressed they have been and, you know, make sure that uh, um, uh, we are, we're able to understand that particular fatigue that is happening. And to this effect, we try to provide as much training and support as possible, both to our faculty and to our students as well. Um, as I mentioned, the online environment, um, when we were preparing for the fall of 2020 back in June, we were hoping that this will be a completely hybrid uh, system in which we will have a significant fraction of in-person uh, attendance in, of students in the classes. Unfortunately, this did not happen. And we had to pivot almost instantly to make sure we address the new, um, the new conditions. Uh, but I, I must say that we have been able to do this effectively because the online environment has never been um, foreign to us. And in that respect, and our, and our faculty have very easily adapted. I should mention that the number of our faculty actually come on campus to teach from classrooms, as I do. Actually, I am right here today in my office. And uh, I do go, I come here pretty much every day. And uh, when I was teaching my class, I would go down to one of the classrooms and teach the class. It was so 
um, uh, unusual, uh, if you like, uh, to see that my class was empty and instead it was replaced by, um, you know, uh, the um, pictures of the students who were participating remotely. And my hope is that we will soon get out of this uh, model and be able to do have a lot more in-person engagement as well. Um, so I hope I answered your questions, uh, Derek, but um, I'd like to flip this question and ask you, all of you, all the students, um, how did you see your transition to an online format uh, and what, what are the positive and negative aspects of this? So uh, please go ahead and, and uh, re uh, reply to this. I can go first. Um, I mean, first of all, there's like the obvious like monotony of having to sit in like your childhood bedroom and do college from there and everything. Um, so like, it's a little bit difficult. The lines get really blurred between like where you are when you're doing work and like when you're just relaxing. Um, but other than that, like I actually really enjoy the flexibility that it's come to offer. Um, like a couple weeks ago, I was able to drive and visit a friend in Kansas, uh, like in the middle of the week. And I never would have been able to do that if I was uh, tied to in-person class. So uh, that was super nice. Um, also being in quarantine allowed me to grow this wonderful mustache. So I'm grateful. <laughs> yeah, kind I'm of, just, thinking, oh. oh, sorry. Okay, <laughs> kind of piggybacking off of what Derek said, uh, for me, it's been really nice to have the flexibility, although it has been hard to kind of stay as productive as I felt like I was when I was physically going places. Um, but for example, I'm involved with women in engineering and we've actually had a spike in attendance for our events because there's just so many less barriers with logging onto a Zoom meeting and being active. So it's been really nice to see that. Um, I was also going to say I did have a mustache too, but I shaved it last week. So mustache growing was a hobby that I found over my quarantine times. Um, but originally the transition, I actually thought it wasn't as bad, at least last semester, because I think the professors did like such a great job of kind of like being flexible with their schedules and accommodating to all the students, no matter their time zones. Uh, but like this semester, I kind of found it a lot more challenging to maintain motivation, like seeing you have six or 13 weeks now ahead of you like how you're gonna get through that and find motivation to do it. Um, and just being confined to like a small screen on your laptop rather than seeing the big beautiful USC campus and walking on it every day, it's kind of just harder to find outlets for like stress and social interaction. Um, but like Derek said, like finding new hobbies in quarantine has been great. I've been learning to cook a lot more uh, and that's been a great source of stress relief for me. And then also uh, just like being able to go to student orgs that are doing all these awesome online events and like virtual opportunities to get engaged has also been super helpful too throughout the whole process. Definitely. Um, I think I actually had a little bit of a unique um, experience with the transition to online classes in that um, last semester I had taken a leave of absence to do an extended internship. So this is my very first semester of <laughs> online USC classes. I feel like I'm in it with the freshmen like <laughs> i'm experiencing those challenges for the very first time just like them um and to echo what you three said before i think there's of course a whole host of challenges um a big one for me is just like kind of the mental drain of staring at a computer screen all day when i'm used to walking to different buildings and even just like having a break from my eyes by not looking at a screen all day um, but some of the really positive things for me have been getting a chance to be home. I think you can tell um, in my home and spending time with my family. Um, and also, as a lot of you mentioned, um, the increased flexibility that Zoom classes provides has been really wonderful. Um, I think having online uh, discussion sections and online office hours has been really beneficial. And in, in, sense, in some sense has actually enabled me to engage a little bit more with classes than I previously have just because the barriers to interact with my professors and my TAs are so much lower than they used to be. Um, so I actually have a question for you, um, Dean Yortzos. Um, I'm curious if you can share with us any plans the university is talking about for next semester. I will do that, uh, Sienna. But before that, I would like to mention that, uh, I, as, actually, as I was uh, uh, talking to Sienna just before the, we started this program, I think the last time I saw her was in London about a year ago when she was there representing USC in the Grand Challenges um, uh, Summit. Uh, she was part of an all-female group actually that uh, uh, participated in a pitch competition 
And uh, of course, you know, just like it is in these cases, the winning team was the home team. There was a team from England. And so <laughs> we didn't have to worry about that. And I should also mention that Jacob has been uh, part of the NAE action plan for against COVID. He participated as a as a as a as a Grand Challenge scholars uh, uh, student, and he had been. Uh, thank you, uh, Jacob, for for doing this for us. It was it's wonderful. Um, so let me answer this question, uh, Sienna. Um, so I think even though it's early to share concrete plans um, and. What we are planning to do is we are strongly advocating to bring our students back on campus as soon as it is safe to do so. And so we have been uh, working very diligently on the strategy to do that. And that will be, of course, of some sort of a partial density depending on the level of the epidemic and where the epidemic has subsided. One thing that people do not perhaps know widely is that Anything that we do has to be approved by the state and the local uh, authorities, the Los Angeles County and the state of California. So any plans we have have to be approved by them. And so, however, we do very um, a lot of preparations to for our classrooms for social distancing, if, assuming that we will be able to go to some in-person environment, uh, developing enhanced cleaning procedures, uh, conducting robust testing of students. Right now, until now, we have conducted more than 25,000 tests since the beginning of August, and we test about 3,000 uh, people per week. Nonetheless, uh, the way to do this is we're going essentially to do the same thing that we did in um, the spring when we were preparing for fall, to have our spring class schedule to be flexible so that we can pivot quickly from online to hybrid to in-person modality whenever we can. And as I mentioned before, because of the facilities that we have in the school, this is very easily done, and it is something that we're looking forward to accomplish. Um, we will be able, I believe that the president and the provost will share more information about the initial planning for the semester next week. And I expect that in terms of um, uh, length and in terms of uh, structure will not be very different than the fall with respect to attendance in person, hybrid or online. I think will be, uh, however, uh, the difference, uh, however, will be probably in that direction as well. We have with us also uh, 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 so, uh, Vice Dean Eric Johnson of uh, Academic Programs. Eric, I don't know if you want to say anything in this. I think you summarized it very well, Dean uh, At the moment, we are planning for a broad selection of, of uh, classes being taught hybrid, uh, but it depends on the university and the and the county uh, deciding whether it is safe or not. Uh, most of our faculty uh, have uh, expressed willingness to, to teach on campus. Um, and some classes uh, fit better in an online environment. Some classes uh, will fit just better in person. And so the pedagogy will drive some of it, but uh, we hope to have a broad selection of classes uh, offered in a hybrid format to accommodate both those who are in LA and those who might uh, still be online from elsewhere. And one of the things that we would love to have is the ability to have our student uh, teams. We have a lot of extracurricular activities. This, uh, the new Bond Family Makerspace that I show you, which is a brand new thing. I, I just visited the other day. It's wonderful. And we just you know, can't wait for it to be used. OK, so um, I'd like to ask uh, Jacob and Sienna uh, to tell us how do you engage with your classmates and friends in this online environment where you're pretty distant, I suppose, you know, from your classmates and all that? How, what, is the, what is this uh, uh, engagement? Uh, how does it look like <laughs> in this environment? Um, I can start. So yeah, as a student leader for like a few organizations at USC and within Viterbi, uh, engagement and like I said earlier kind of finding this sense of motivation has definitely been one of the biggest challenges for us so far and especially among all the other like presidents and council members that I've been talking to it seems like we're all kind of facing this idea of like motivation and having people come join um, but to start we've probably just been trying to create more like formal casual kind of like get to know you spaces where they seem more just like casual interactions that you'd have on campus so we really are working on kind of connecting people from all over like the country and across the world to put them in the same space where they can have like casual interactions and kind of find new things to talk about and common interests. Um, so like in total, just some of the orgs that I've been involved with have probably already hosted over like 20 to 40 events just this semester 
And those can include like really fun at home, like brewing lessons with a chemistry professor. Uh, we had done like virtual coffee study and game nights. And then we even have been still hosting like some networking events so that our members can still have a chance to like meet professionals and like enjoy recruiting and then just search for new careers, like despite the pandemic. Um, so overall, like it's just been learning like the new tips and trades, I guess, of like this Zoom space and how you can like use the breakout rooms to your best advantage and kind of get people out of their comfort zone in a way and like getting them to express themselves and talk about their interests. And that seems to be working so far. Like it's definitely ex going like at an exponential curve and it's working, so. <laughs> exponential seems to be the word. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, I completely agree. I think to take that question um, kind of a little bit more to how to keep engaging with friends um, while we're remote and not, you know, living together anymore. I think the big thing for me has just been taking advantage of the different forms of remote communication, like making sure to reach out and text and FaceTime call um, my classmates and friends that I used to chat with, you know, every day. Um, I think a big way that I've been doing that just to incorporate it more in my schedule um, are to on my evening walks to FaceTime a friend while I'm walking. Like I mentioned, I think the two biggest ways the pandemic has affected my health is that I'm so much more sedentary now and I'm deprived of human interaction. <laughs> so I've tried to make it a routine to kind of combine those two things um, and just add that to my schedule to be taking care of my health in those two ways. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, Dean Yard says, I have another question for you. Uh, what is Viterbi doing to help with creating and maintaining community in and involvement while online only? Um, well, you know, there is a number of uh, things that we try to put together, like uh, for competitions. So we had the Sustainathon, the Viterbi Virtual Sustainathon, which uh, happened uh, about uh, three weeks ago, actually. We had uh, in fact, uh, President Carl Ford was a surprise special guest to this. Uh, students had the opportunity to do um, to compete for 48 hours in a design sprint uh, in order to be able to uh, come up with solutions in terms of sustainable, sustainable solutions of, of all kinds of things. We have a Viterbi virtual cafe, which is open 24 seven. I hope you, you visit it uh, seven days a week. So, it's, uh, so this is an open student led space that can be used to meet, talk, study, and socialize with other Viterbi students. We have a very interesting and new app called Experience Viterbi app. It's uh, actually, it's the only, we are the only school with a student engagement web-based app like this. And it is a place for students to learn about student engagement opportunities across many organizations of Viterbi. So I think this way um, you connect in a, different, in a different way as well. Many, many different things. So, I think that uh, you know you probably are aware of how much our uh, Viterbi uh, student affairs and engagement team uh, uh, is reaching out to to with events of all this type. So I think I will close with a, a final question on to Derek and Radika. Um, what can we do as a school to help you with uh, this? Uh, you know, fatigue and stresses that develop. I know that, you know, there's a number of, um, of uh, uh, ideas out there and I would like to hear your answers. Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for asking. Um, I think one thing that I've noticed is that a number of my professors have had kind of different strategies in adapting to the online environment, um, which can just kind of, it tends to add a, that much more chaos to like the student lives because in addition to us having to transition to online in general, we're also like learning the slightly different uh, nuanced ways that each of our classes are operating. Um, so I think like maybe providing a more general uh, set of guidelines to the professors would be um, a big help. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, adding to that, yeah, I think everyone has been super accommodating and understanding. And a lot of times as students, it's hard for us to know that we can ask for help and ask for support. So just making that even more clear, you know, just that there's support there for you if you just ask for it and reach out. Yeah. Thank you, Rodrigo. So I think we, we should close this portion of the program because I want to give plenty of time for the Q&A. We have quite a few questions that have come in. 
through the Q&A section of the portal. So thank you so much, Radhika, Jacob, Derek, and Sienna for the great questions and for sharing your insights. And I know you all do a lot behind the scenes in your leadership roles to really support our students. And I, I'm so appreciative for all of that. And so thank you. Um, next, uh, we have been, I have been seeing the questions as they come in on the Q&A portion of the, uh, of the, um, the app. So I will, uh, you know, disseminate those and have some of our next panelists answer those. Uh, first, I would like to introduce to you Candace Tusheda. She's our Associate Dean of Corporate Engagement and Programs. And of course, you've already met Dr. Eric Johnson, who's our Viterbi Vice Dean for Academic Programs. And so the four of us will be here to answer questions that you might have. So um, let me get started. Um, Dean Yorts says, I think this one, first one, I think is probably one that you could best answer. Earlier this summer, when the move to all online was announced, Dr. Fultz announced that summer school would be free for students who stayed home. Are there any updates on this? And without the Turby's overseas internships and other programs for students, um, you know, summer school might not be a valid option. So this was something that I think was floated out there. And I'm not sure if that's something that's still in the conversation at the university. I don't believe it is. Are you talking about for next summer now? Yes. Uh, oh, that's actually a little bit too early for this conversation, I think. But uh, definitely something. So, you know, the deans and the provosts meet very regularly. We meet three times a week, actually, which is uh, um, talking about Zoom fatigue <laughs> of a different type. Uh, and uh, but that's something that we can I can definitely bring up if this is a question that we could definitely can do that. I know that Questions that have been asked, uh, the, similar to the things that we did in the spring, have been about students uh, electing to take a pass-fail grade versus a, 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 an actual grade. And I think this is a, 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 something that it is right now an, a question to be resolved, as well as uh, the PDP program, how to make sure that uh, people can take, let's say, the master's PDP program, um, with, which is something that we have been using before as well. So these are, these are issues that are pending and hopefully we will make a progress that it is going to be helpful to all our students. Thank you, Dean Yorthus. And that was one of the other questions about pass, no pass. Is that gonna be an option for this semester? And uh, I do know, and uh, Eric, you may have more insight, but I do know as of today, that is not an option, um, but maybe you have more insights about maybe if that's going to be changing or, um, or what, you're, what you know about that. Um, just, let, let me just say that um, it, it, right now it has not been announced, but I think there is, um, it is not off the table, and it is something that, uh, that I think the provost and the deans uh, will have to make a, a decision pretty soon. Uh, the, pro the, the, the system that we had in the spring was very effective, and maybe this is the same system we'll apply on in the fall as well. All right, thank you. Um, Eric, I, this one I think is a good one for you. If next semester is virtual, will Viterbi be taking steps to make up for teaching in labs and gaining lab skills that may be prerequisites for future classes or backfill lab skill acquisition time that was lost this semester? So any thoughts about labs and, and what, what, you know, how that's going to be handled? There's a number of, of things that we're exploring. Uh, some possible short courses to cover just the lab components of some of the classes. Uh, possibly to be offered in the summer, possibly be offered maybe in a, a, a condensed format just prior to the fall semester or the first couple of weeks of the first fall semester next year uh, if this pushes to, to next fall. Uh, possibly we could do the same thing in, in early spring if we're permitted to start, on, start in person. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Candace, this one is for you. Um, could you let us know if are there still opportunities for students um, in terms of internships and jobs and preparation uh, in that domain um, from a remote uh, location? Absolutely. So recruitment is still happening and it's not too early for a freshman to start to think about their summer internships. So um, if your student has um, not connected with the Career Connections office, please do. It's very unique that we have a career center um, specifically for engineering students connecting with engineering companies. Um, we have right now over 600 job postings available for students online just for USC engineering students. So get them connected, um, reach out to our office. They get weekly newsletters. We're in the Viterbi app as well. So it, it's not too soon to begin um, and the opportunities are available. Thank you, Candice. Um, Eric, you might be able to answer this next question. Will consideration be made to students who are in different time zones for returns, um, East Coast and overseas? And, and how is that? And how is that? Yeah. I, I, and I, I unquestionably, yeah, I, 
we, we almost certainly will have, even if we're back mostly on campus, uh, there's a good chance we will have some students still remote uh, in the spring, whether it's because of visa reasons or health reasons or, or otherwise. And so I'm certain that the university will ask faculty to make accommodations, trying to uh, uh, record, not trying to, recording classes so they're available asynchronously to students who are in different time zones and trying to make alternate arrangements for students to take exams and other things and be in somewhat reasonable hours during their, their daylight hours or early evening in their time zones. Thank you, Eric. Um, maybe one of our students can answer this next question because this is an interesting one. What strategies have students found to be successful in dealing with living with their family while taking classes and socializing? That's a great question. Hmm, I guess I can take a stab at that. Um, <laughs> always, but please feel free to jump in. Um, anyone else, if you have thoughts. But um, one thing I found that's been really useful um, is if I am like taking a test or if I'm um, like downstairs but listening to a class and I really need to make sure it's quiet, I just um, send like a text to my family and be like, oh, sorry if I don't respond to you. I'm currently in a class. Um, just so they know, because I know sometimes that's a little confusing. A school schedule isn't like a nine to five. So it's nice to give them a heads up for like when I'm in classes and when I'm not in classes um, and like why I might not respond um, if my AirPods are in and I'm listening to a class. Um, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Dirk. I'm sorry. Dirk? That's it. Um, for me, I've been using the lamp method, which was kind of uh, the idea is that you turn on your lamp when you're working, because I think even when you're outside of classes and you're trying to focus, it's really hard to tell your family, like, I can't talk to you right now, I'm sorry, even though you really want to. Um, so just having that lamp on as like a sign for everyone and for your own mindset and then turning it off when you're not working and you're just relaxing. Yeah, I, I do the same thing. I'm going to echo both of those because um, I can have privacy when I'm in classes or uh, doing work or whatever um, if I'm in my room, but it's just not sustainable for me to be in my room all day every day. So uh, if I am downstairs, I just I just let my family know I, I kind of need this space. I need some need a breather. <laughs> Thank um, you for that. Yeah, oh, there, yeah. there was a question about uh, the CS building, which I can, I think I can answer. Yes. Um, yes. So the CS building is uh, proceeding uh, uh, as, as planned. We have the architect that they are designing the, the interior part of the building and, and then the, the exterior. The ground breaking, there will be a ground breaking in, uh, in person, um, except, you know, of course, especially distance uh, in, uh, on February 11, and then uh, we expect the building to be fully uh, built by sometime the beginning or the, the middle of the uh, uh, 2023. And that's really the, the plan that we have. As I have mentioned before, the building will be built at the place where I am parking right now. So that's actually a bittersweet situation for me, <laughs> but I will have to move my car somewhere else. <laughs> but we are very excited about it. Thank you, Dean Yorthus. There is a question in here about how is Viterbi promoting casual interactions outside of the classroom between freshmen since they have not had a chance to meet and get to know each other. Um, you know, one thing as Dean Yorthus mentioned in his welcome is we opened a virtual cafe. It opened last week and we're going to see how that works. It's just a space where students can log in 24 hours and kind of get to know each other. I think we, 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 we figured out that the students don't always want structured um, events, but they do want to have an opportunity to be able to meet each other without uh, an organized event. And maybe Sienna, you can talk a little bit about what's happening um, as a freshman academy coach, because I know you work with a lot of the freshman academy students, and that's been a big focus that you've had. Definitely, absolutely. I was hoping I would have a chance to um, give this plug, <laughs> but encourage them to um, engage with their freshman academy class, um, go to the events that their coaches are preparing. Um, all freshmen are in freshman academy courses, which are essentially um, two unit classes that are designed to um, allow them to interact with other freshman engineers and learn a bit about engineering ethics and the different disciplines of engineering um, kind of, and kind of acclimate to life at Viterbi. Um, and uh, in addition to very cool professors, Eric Johnson, I believe is one of them. Um, you also, every class has two upperclassmen Viterbi students called the academy coaches. 
um, that are there to um, organize events and facilitate kind of interaction between the students. So um, push your freshmen to go to the events and to interact with us because we're looking to interact with them. That's a great, thank you so much. And all the work that you, all the academy coaches are doing. Um, another question here is given that current freshmen miss their first year dorm life and live classes, will the Turby plan any in-person activities for these students when they finally get to campus? Um, I can take that if you guys don't mind and Dean Northsis or Eric, if you'd also like to, uh, definitely, definitely, definitely. I can say that we are so looking forward to our, to meeting our freshmen on campus. So, um, you know, we, we offer a plethora of options, I think, uh, right now online, but as soon as the students are able to come to campus, we will definitely develop a lot of uh, the programming that we would have otherwise done in person, uh, games, activities, um, an opportunity for them to meet others uh, in person. So it is, uh, it's something that we're all looking forward to. And, and I think our, I, I think when it's, it's allowable, we will definitely do that. We, we okay. definitely owe them that experience that they was, was sort of stolen from them. So definitely we have to make up for it. So there's a question here about commencement uh, 2021. Uh, Dean Yortz, did you want to answer that or I can do that or you, you probably can? Um, well, the commencement 2021 is, is, is supposed to happen in a regular way. I mean, this is, a, this is how we're planning. Uh, of course, you know, everything depends on, on the progress that is made with respect to, uh, uh, you know, combating this epidemic. Uh, but the, in fact, even the commencement 2020 is also going to happen during that weekend as well. In other words, for students who graduated last spring and they were not able to have a, a commencement ceremony, the plan is to have that ceremony on Saturday, uh, the week of that of commencement of which Friday will be the commencement of 2021 and Saturday will be the commencement of 2020. So that is the plan. We'll see how far we can go. Okay, there's a question here, uh, Candace, uh, maybe you and I can answer this one together. Um, how realistic is it for freshmen to obtain internships, especially without having a lab training? Uh, I just wanna jump in here and say that uh, we have launched a uh, research program um, that students can conduct uh, remote research. Um, we're just working out the kinks right now and it'll be in full swing in the spring semester, which will allow students, whether they're on campus or remotely to do uh, research. And, and we're gonna pay particular uh, attention to some of the freshmen who have, might not have had an opportunity to actually do some of the things on campus. Um, and Candace, if you wanna answer that question about internships, given the fact that students may not have had lab training. Right, it's actually um, increasing in terms of interest from a lot of our companies because they found that having an intern sometimes translates to that person working for them full time. So they've been wanting to engage students earlier in their career and hoping to build a relationship with them coming back intern summer after summer and hopefully getting a full time position. So what I recommend is um, there is our system simplicity where all of our job postings are your student can go in and see what they're matching for right now. And so companies who are interested in hiring um, rising sophomores into uh, summer internships will have that checked off. So they will, they will indicate that they're interested in hiring freshmen um, who are entering a sophomore year for that summer. So you would be able to log in tonight and see what is available today. You would be able to do this weekly because every day we get new postings. But more companies are making this as part of their strategy to start engaging engineers at a younger age and creating a pipeline into their organizations. Thank you, Candace. I should mention also in terms of engagement, something that we did not uh, talk about is that we have this um, uh, entrepreneurship uh, competitions that are happening. Uh, so this, um, this uh, semester, the MSE Entrepreneurship Prize Competition and the Min Family engineering challenge are to be to start as well. So we, we encourage students to participate in it. And, and because it's, these are use, very useful, they learn a number of skills about how to, let's say, create a plan and a startup and, and things like that. So this would be, um, we recommend our students to participate in it. Thank you. Uh, we have a question either for Eric or Giannis uh, or Dean Yorsis. Could Viterbi use a similar bubble technique USC will be using for Trojan teams to bring back Viterbi students back to school sooner than the LA County, especially due to the lab component of engineering? So the only possibility that I can see that has some connection there would be related to uh, work that has to do with uh, labs, 
classes that are laboratories or you know out of the uh, outside the curriculum activities because everything else most likely will have to be the same as with the other schools as well in other words i don't believe the university will make an exception for viterbi just because uh, but if there's a specific reason to make that exception and that could be labs or other things then it is i, I don't know if this is an idea there's a lot of ideas that people are entertaining right now and, uh, you know, um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I know that uh, clearly the NBA bubble worked very well. Uh, I understand that the, uh, the, MLA, the, uh, um, the baseball bubble, I think, is working well as well. So I'm not sure. Maybe we should go in that direction, too. I know many of the art schools at USC are, are in a way, suffering from this because for them, being in person and also being in, in, in uh, partnership with many others together, it, it's an important part of their training, you know, whether it is music or it is dance or other things as well. And they are trying to come up with interesting ideas. I think in our case, the, the corresponding effect will be in labs and also out, outside the curriculum activities. Thank you, Giannis. Um, here's a question about a student who is admitted in the spring, uh, is now a sophomore and has applied to numerous clubs and has not been able to get in one despite an ex being an excellent student. How do kids get experience in clubs with these limitations? Um, if there's a particular club, I can answer that one unless Eric, you'd like to, you have a, a, a response as well. If there's a particular club that this, your student is having difficulty, connect with my office. Um, you know, while the club's kind of our student run, we definitely facilitate a lot of that, as does Dr. Johnson. And so we would, we would want to know if there were challenges um, in terms of making those connections, because we certainly could do that from the VASE office um, in particular. But Eric, if you would like to add anything there. I mean, it sounded like there was a question about, about academic qualifications, and, and most of our clubs are pretty, pretty open to everybody. Um, if it's more a question of just meeting people and getting to know them, and uh, so forth, I, that's something that the VASE office can help with. And definitely um, encourage your sons and daughters to, to reach out to us at any time and, and uh, we, can, we can help kind of navigate some of those things if they continue to be challenging. All right, uh, Candace, this is for you. The fall online Viterbi career fair was crowded and very frustrating for students for a variety of reasons. What changes do you foresee implementing the spring career fair and should it also be online? So yeah, the career fair is one of the, the busiest events that we have, um, uh, recruitment events that we have. So the virtual fair was, it was our, our first uh, time offering it. And it was actually, um, when we, we look back at the numbers, we had around 475 unique employers there. Um, and we had around 2000 students attend. Um, when we looked at the chat logs, just to see what the one-on-one um, -on -one conversations were like, we had over um, 8,300 one-on-one connections between an employer and a student. So those connections we hope turn into job interviews and other opportunities. Um, but some lessons learned with the virtual environment is you're, you're not in a line. So you're unable to see how many people are ahead of you. So one of the things that we're gonna do differently for the spring is to um, do a little bit better the, the virtual queue management, letting people know how many people are in the line. That was not something that was being shared for this expo that will happen in a virtual environment in the future. And we tested it out this past Monday for another networking event. Um, so that's something that's missing in person. You see that there's, you know, 30 people in front of you. Now we're going to let you know and make sure that students realize where they are in the queue. But the connections were happening. Um, the, the, the fair itself was between 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And there were definitely peak times. A number of the students were there later in the afternoon. So we wanna make sure we remind students that those same companies and employers are there at 7 a.m. They were also there at 6 p.m. So everybody logging in at nine or at noon or between the hours of 12 to four, which was really a peak time, that, that was when the queue times were really long. So the students that are there at 7 a.m., the students that are there late in the evening, they'll, they'll probably have a, a higher likelihood of maybe making those connections. So there, we had, 24 hours of fair time available for the students. So we'll, we'll do our best to make sure students know that it's, it's more than just four hours in the day. It's a longer time and we'll let them know um, how many people are ahead of them waiting to speak to a representative from their, their dream companies. So lessons learned, definitely. 
Thank you, Candace. So I'm going to, these all, next few questions all kind of are related to each other, and I know we're late on time, so uh, we'll just take a few more questions. Um, what, what is available for new transfer students? What kind of support is available for transfer students? And what about for students who uh, are switching their majors? So um, we do have a series through the base office, which are for major exploration options. So students that want to switch their majors, we do have some opportunities for them to attend some events. So please um, connect with base and find out what those are. All of the activities and engagement opportunities that we have on the Experience Viterbi app that Dean North just mentioned are available to all students, not just transfer students. Um, but sometimes I think students who uh, feel like they don't have the four years or uh, feel like they, they might uh, be looking for something a little bit different. So again, if you don't see something on there that, uh, that resonates uh, to students with them, they should definitely reach out to us. And I do also know that the university, uh, there's a club centrally that was formed just recently just for transfer students to kind of get transfer students acclimated or together engaged um, university-wide. So if, if the students who are transfer students have not um, seen that club or organization, um, please um, have them reach out to us and we can point them to that direction. So um, there are a number of things happening and if, if, uh, if, if, if they're not visible, we wanna make sure that we, um, we make those available. So I think um, we are, what is the name of the office you just mentioned? The Viterbi Admission and Student Engagement. Thank you, Jill, for that question. Uh, that is your home away from home for your students. We, uh, we, we are all eagerly ex and excited to meet and work with all of the students. So, um, you know, we are just not an advisement office or an admissions office, but anything that the students have, any questions the parents have, um, we, we look forward to engaging with them. And, uh, and, and answering whatever questions. Um, and to help the students navigate, USC sometimes seems overwhelming um, and we are there to kind of, even if there are things outside of our office to make sure that we help the students make those connections. Okay, so I think um, I tried to keep us on time. We're a little bit late, but I think we got through most of the questions. Um, thank you, Candace, Eric, Dean Yortzis, um, families, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Uh, we hope you all enjoyed your time with the Viterbi Trojan Family Weekend events. And uh, as a tradition at USC, we will end our event with the USC Trojan Marching Band. Have a great night and fight on. <laughs>